First John chapter number two. <clears throat> I'm gonna read verse number twenty four this morning. <clears throat> the Bible says, Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Now, by chapter number two of this epistle, <clears throat> the Apostle John right before this is hit on we know that we're in the last time because there were many antichrists that there were many that said that Jesus was not the son of God that their testimony their lifestyle and everything about them said that Christ wasn't who he said he was and they thought they were living in the last times because there were many then that were antichrists now look at what we got right at that point there were still prophecies that hadn't been fulfilled yet but now all those prophecies have been fulfilled. The only thing remaining that hasn't happened is the rapture. But yet today, so many antichrists, so many with the spirit of antichrist, so many that embrace a lifestyle that goes against what our Savior said was the way, the truth, and the life, all of which were him. Right? Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. To denounce that Christ is the way to heaven is to denounce that he was the son of God it denounces that he existed in the first place John 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God to denounce that Christ was who he said he was is to deny that God existed at all people don't understand that but then when people start embracing or accepting or tolerating certain things they wonder why God stops moving because you're allowing or you are endorsing something to happen that testifies to the fact that he doesn't exist I don't know where that came from but that wasn't anywhere in the notes but in verse number 24 he says I know all that's going on out there many antichrist out in the world you're in the world you're not of the world but you got to yield you got to live around you've got to face every day people that go out and live a life that says the one that you love supremely isn't worth loving and he says here's what you got to do and he says let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning if that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you ye also shall continue in the son and in the father so his message is one of continuance he says I'm not giving you anything new there's no new revelation right by the time the Apostle John finished penning the book of Revelation. God said, don't add to, don't take away. There is nothing new. In fact, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. You could study from when God said, let there until eternity in the omega of time. Everything is the same. How is it? It's the way that God designed it to be. Man was made to be a free oral or moral agent. Man chose to sin and death entered into the world by sin but God made a plan before the foundation of the world to redeem fallen man so that he could be with him for all of eternity that the message that we have heard from the beginning of your salvation has not changed if you really got saved it was because you understood that you was a sinner that Christ made a way for you to be saved you repented of your sin and you asked him to save you and you put your faith into him and you by using that measure of faith right God did for us what we could not do for ourselves and how did we get saved by grace through faith right. we did what we could which was to say Lord I, I repent of what I was and I believe you can make me something different and by using that faith God used grace to do what you couldn't do what have we heard from the beginning but God's message to man from the beginning was love he loved you with an everlasting love told Job he knew him when he was in the belly God knew you long before you would ever existed and God still will remember those that are cast into the lake of fire and receive the second death no one has ever taken a breath that God will ever forget or did not know existed and God loved each and every one of them with his very being because God is love God demonstrated part of his holiness towards them 
in love. Gave part of himself, both through love and his son, that they might attain to what God wanted them to have from the beginning. That they were joint heirs with Christ. That by one son, many would become the sons of God. What have we heard from the beginning? We've heard that we're not much. But with God, doesn't matter how little you have, you're always in the majority. Doesn't matter how low you get, if you're on God's side and God's on your side, you're on the winning side. We've heard from the beginning that we'd have mountaintops and we'd have valleys, but he'd be with us every step of the way. When the Apostle John writes to him here, let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. He's talking about the fullness of the gospel. The gospel doesn't stop with you getting saved. The gospel has built in perpetuity. What's that mean? Once you get saved, the Holy Ghost disciples you, and then you go out and tell others. Well, Brother Jordan, how are we supposed to go out and tell others? Don't worry, God already figured that out. He told them, after that which the Holy Ghost has come upon you, talking about the day of Pentecost, that they would receive power to go be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. You are not a great witness because you know how to talk well. See, I even said talk well. Didn't say talk good that time. You are not a great witness because you're able to go out and relate to people. And you're, go, you're able to go out and make friends. Although God may use all of those things as an avenue for you to witness. A great witness is a great witness because they're in tune with the Holy Ghost and they yield themselves to be used as an instrument of God. The same is true of anyone that's a great witness as anyone that's a great preacher. You have to yield yourself and let God take control. Where did we hear that? All the way back in the beginning. God told Adam and Eve after they had sinned, He showed them that because of their mistake, blood had to be shed. That they were no longer without sin. They were no longer perfect the way that God had made them in the Garden of Eden. Every day when you wake up, especially a lot of people, Zach, besides you, I think everybody else in here might be older than me, and I'm already getting to the point where I wake up, things hurt that I didn't use the day before. Right? Like there's no reason for them to hurt. Things pop that didn't pop yesterday, but yet now all of a sudden they're popping. Right? I could have the laziest, most chill day that I have ever had and then somehow wake up sore the next day. That doesn't make sense to me. Okay, this flesh knows that it's going to the ground. Every day when we wake up, we know that we're not perfect. If we was perfect, we wouldn't have to fix our hair every morning. Brother Ed, I'm sorry, you got rid of that problem a long time ago. Right, if we were perfect... Wouldn't have to go to somebody called the doctor or the dentist or the dermatologist or the optometrist. Right? We know that we are not perfect beings. But the message that we heard from the beginning is that God can take you out of the muck and mire of the world, take that clay and mold you into a vessel of honor for Him. Amen. Those that are antichrist, those that want to get you away from the word and get you away from walking with God they want you to believe one very simple thing it's been around for thousands of years long before they started calling it this they had many other names for it but it's called humanism and it takes the power of God and it gives it to man and tells you that you are able to do things you're not able to breathe unless God lets you you're not able to recognize who you are and have control over your own members if God doesn't say so. But yet the world and the spirit and the doctrine of Antichrist will tell you that you can make yourself into whatever you want to be. That's true, but they all look the same. It all looks like a bunch of mess. It looks like a pile of garbage. Because all the work of man's hands are condemned with that thing that they're cursed with, sin. Nothing lasts outside of what God builds. Even the religious crowd in Jesus' day knew that. 
they were wicked and they were worldly and they weren't focused on God but they understood this much they said if this movement that the apostles are doing is of God no man can stop it but if it's not of God it's going to fizzle out real quick even they knew that if God does it there's nothing you can do to stop it to undermine it or to destroy it why do you think the Bible tells us that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God God established hell not for man but for the devil and his angels God established his church to pull souls out of hell so of course if God envisioned, intended and empowered the church to where hell has no power over it, of course the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God God ordained it that way. But in all of these scenarios, that why do people die and go to hell? Because of unbelief. God didn't predestine them to go to hell. God didn't give somebody a bad bill of goods and say, well, sorry, you're just one of them that has to go there. Why is the world turned into the cesspool that it is? Why do homes fall apart? Why do people turn to drugs? All because of choices. Man's choices. We know that it's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We know that it's God's will that after they come to repentance, that they should be fashioned into the image of His Son. That they should walk the very footsteps that Jesus trailblazed for us some 2,000 years ago. That we should walk hand in hand with God. So why doesn't that happen? because of man's choices but what's the choice as a Christian that allows us to continue because remember that's what he's focusing on he wants you to continue with the son and the father what's that choice I see that it's a yielding choice see it's a choice where you've got to humble yourself and I see that it's a choice where you've got to give control, give yourself over to God well, why do you say that brother Jordan because he says let in other words allow it God doesn't force his will upon you you have to embrace it, you have to choose to accept it let that therefore abide in you we've talked about that word abide before abide isn't a temporary stay if you make some place your abode that's your home you abide where you intend to put down roots you don't abide in a hotel room you don't abide right at a RV park you abide at your home you may dwell in a tent or as David, he dwelled in caves for a while, but his abode was where God gave him his home. First is in Hebron, and then it was in Jerusalem when he was the king. You may dwell someplace, but if you abide somewhere, that means that you intend on staying there. Don't intend on going anywhere else. So when he says, let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning... What's he talking about? Literally, he's talking about the Word of God. Right? We heard the Word. Why? Because it was preached to us. Because it was presented to us. And because the Holy Ghost convicted us or convinced us that what was preached and what we read was true. When he talks about that, which he heard, he's talking about doctrine. He's talking about the preached Word, the preserved Word, He's talking about what God says about your life. And the beauty of it is, none of it contradicts itself. The world would have you think that, but every page in this book agrees. I need to be more like him. That which I heard from the beginning was that God said, if you'll put your faith and trust in me, if you'll give your life over to me, I'll make you into a vessel of honor for his use. Not for my honor, for his honor. Not for my glory, for his glory. Yeah. So what's the choice? You have to let 
the word of God dw not dwell but abide in you you know why revival meetings get real high because the word of God dwells in people for a time and you know why it goes right back to the way it was before after the meeting's over because it was just dwelling they didn't make it abide in their hearts abide in their lives in order for the word of God to abide in your life you've got to let the Holy Ghost make it permanent you can't add something holy to yourself because you're not holy there are certain things you're not qualified to handle but I don't wear the crown that sits up top Jesus' head as he's in glory but some things are above my pay grade but, and I'll, I'll be real quick to admit, there's a whole lot of things that aren't even holiness that are way above my pay grade. I don't want anything to do with them. But there's a reason that if you're smart, you only leave loaded handguns around with toddlers in the house. They're not equipped to handle those things. But they're incapable of understanding what it is, what it does, how to use it, and how not to use it. A lot of the reasons so many churches are in such a bad shape today is because some people tried to wield things that were God's and they didn't know how to use it, what it could do, what it couldn't do, and they made a mess of the situation. If you want the Word of God, if you want God Himself to abide in you, because again, the Word of God is an extension of Christ. If you want more God in your life, you can't add it. God's got to add it. But he says, let it abide in you. You may not be able to add it to yourself, but you certainly can remove it from yourself. You've got to yield to the Holy Ghost and allow Him to make room for it. Then, place it there, but then ultimately, make it permanent. What good is it to redo the floor in your house if you tore it out two months later? What good is it to go to the doctor get the medicine that the doctor says is going to make you better? Think and know that that medicine is going to help you, but never take it. The whole point of letting something abide is that you've got to give over control. We're okay with that for a little bit. Until what? Until you hit one of them bumps in the road that you weren't expecting? And it throws all of your plans way off course and you want to put your hands back on the steering wheel again. You want to say, well, it worked for a little bit, but we got to go back to plan B. With God, there is no plan B. With God, there's always been one plan, the plan that he put in place long before everything else came into existence, which was what? Christ. Is it any wonder that Christ said that he needed to go away so that the Comforter could come? Can you imagine trying to live as a Christian without the Holy Ghost indwelling you? I mean, this side of heaven, we can only, we just get glimpses from the Word on the things that the Holy Ghost does in His office work. But do you really think that you know how to apply the principles and the oracles of God's Word to your life as good as the Holy Ghost? I don't think so. I mean, just consider it. You can go back to Genesis 1 1. You'll find that the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. He was around long before earth was created, before there was a heaven. He was only witness to all of it. And when the one who was there to see it all happen starts talking to your soul, that's when business picks up. It's his office work to make you understand it exactly how God wants you to understand it. That's the beauty of one man getting up and preaching and everybody walks out having received something different. How's that happen? Because the Holy Ghost took the humble efforts of a man who was doing his best to follow and preach what God had instructed him and shown him in study. And the Holy Ghost takes that offering, right, that obedience, and he does with it what everyone else needs. The Holy Ghost wants you to understand exactly what God wants you to understand in that moment. That may be different from somebody else, but the Holy Ghost can take the Word as long as it's delivered in truth. He can get you to see what you need to see out of it. 
He can jog your memory and relate two parts of the Bible that even though the preacher didn't preach on it, you was just reading it the other day, but all of a sudden the light bulb comes on and you see the connection. How's that happen? He knows it inside and out just as good as Jesus or the Father. Right? He was the one that used men as pens to pin it down. I'd rather have him teaching me the Word. Well, if I want him to teach me, why wouldn't I want him to do the applying? Right? If it came down to it, if you had the option of Brother Jordan or Leonardo da Vinci doing your portrait, do not pick me. You do not want me applying the paint. Now, if it's Jackson Pollock, I could probably give that guy a run for his money. But when it comes to applying things, you want somebody that knows how to use the tools. We don't even know what the tools are. Let's take a poll. Who knows how God affixes the Word of God into your heart and makes it a part of you? Anybody? That's what I thought. If you understood that, then you would also understand how to save somebody because that's also a work of the Holy Ghost. That he applies the blood, cuts away the flesh, and preserves the soul so that it can sin no more. We don't understand how God applies and makes the Word a part of you any more than we do how he saved you, but we know that he does it. And we know that he expects us to do it, allow him to do it. Why is that? Because he wrote verse number 24. Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. God's ways change not. The message is the same. You know what God expects of people today? The same thing he expected of Adam and Eve. Holiness. Be ye holy for I am holy. He knows that you couldn't be holy on your own so he made a way for a blood to be applied to your life so that Christ could become the propitiation of your sins so that you could have holiness imbued upon you and one day you'll be fashioned in a body just like his and your soul that was saved and will sin no more is going to meet up with that body and you'll be like Christ forevermore. But in the meantime while we're waiting on all that to happen this flesh has to you know, take off corruption and spiritually put on incorruption. Yeah, we're still stuck in this flesh, but your soul's not. Your soul's been free. If the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. Amen. And inside of your heart, the Holy Ghost has to get rid of what the flesh wants to do and apply the Word of God. And if you abide in it, what's the promise? Ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Well, what's that mean? To continue in the Son means to grow in your salvation. You know how you grow and mature as a Christian? You let the Holy Ghost apply more of the Word to your life and you make it and you take it into practice. It becomes a part of you. It gets to the point where one day you start off, you had to think. You probably don't remember this because it happened probably before your consciousness kicked in. But at one point, you really had to focus on putting one foot in front of the other to walk. Now you don't even think about it. You're thinking about what you have to do and in the process of that you just get up and you go. Right? It's something that we take for granted that as humans, once we get something down, we don't need to think about it no more. It just happens. I can't tell you the last time or if I ever have thought to myself, okay, arm, extend and grab that cup. Hand, grasp it. No, it just happens. That it's as quick as thought. Well, how does God want the Word of God to be in your life? Like quick recall. To be a part of you. And if the Holy Ghost put it in you, He's real good. It's been a while since I've used it, but really good at giving you the ability of Holy Ghost recall. If He put it in you, He can bring it back to your remembrance. You say, I don't even remember reading that verse. He remembers when you read it, and He remembers when He applied it to your life. And he brought it right back to your remembrance. If you continue in the Word, you grow, right, in the Son. So you shall continue in the Son. Well, to continue with Jesus, you've got to keep walking with Him. Where's He headed? Well, He's in glory. He paved the way for us to get there. That way that's called straight. The narrow path. 
Well, you can't continue in the sun if you sit down and you stop. It's a continual process. Because God knows what you need for today, but He also knows what you need for tomorrow. And the day after. And the day after that, all the way until you get home to glory. To continue, you've got to allow Him to keep adding those things to you. So that when you're faced, and your faith is put on trial, or you suffer tribulation from the world, you could say as Job, when he tries me, I shall come forth as gold. Job wasn't confident in himself. He was confident in what God had put in Job. He said, he can try me, and all he's going to find is what he put in me. And I know what he put in me was good. It's going to come forth just like gold. Because if God put it in you, it's going to stay in the test. If God applied it, it can't be removed by anything in the world. And so long as you don't remove it, it's there. But he's saying, Brother Jordan, the winds can howl, the waves can beat against the ship, but if the master's in the ship, it's not going to sink. And you may have forgotten the time that you learned such and such a thing. But as soon as that trial or as soon as that storm comes into your life, some of the wood may get peeled back, sails may get a little bit torn, but with what was removed, people are going to get a view of what's on the inside of you. And if what they see is something that God put there, there's nothing they can do to dislodge it, to change it, to cause you to doubt it. It's affixed to you. But it says not only continue in the Son, it says and in the Father. Christ, we know, is the, our friend that's sick is closer than a brother. He suffered complete rejection from the Father so that He could promise you that no one would ever be able to say that you are completely forsaken. Because Jesus promised He'd always be there. He became utterly and entirely alone so that you would never know what that felt like. That's our companion. That's the one that said, everything that I've got, they can have it. They're joint edge. I want them to be just like me. Well, what's it mean to continue in the Father? Well, when you get to the Word, everything about Christ's life, you find that He was focused on doing one thing, the will of the Father. When He was 12 years old and He was in the temple, what did he say? He said he was there on his father's business. Everything that Christ did, he must needs go through Samaria. Why? Because it was the will of the Father. So when it says to continue in the Father, we've gotten the earnest of our salvation that we know that we're one of his. But his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. We've gotten a taste of Christ through the Holy Spirit. Just a taste. But as of yet, we haven't experienced the Father. By faith, we embrace His will. By faith, we endeavor to be used according to His plan. We desire to be fit for the Master's use. But what's it mean to continue in the Father? That means to continue in your purpose. Christ was your companion, is your companion. The Holy Ghost is your guide. But the Father is the one that still calls the shots. Go study the Trinity. You always find that the Son does the will of the Father and that the Holy Ghost is there to bear witness that the two agree. Because God said, after all, that let everything be done in two or three witnesses. That's how doctrines are established in the Bible. You've got to have two or three witnesses in order for it to be a doctrine. Why? Because that's what God had from the beginning, and that's what he wrote down in the uh, uh, Mosaic Law that it took to convict somebody in court or to take something as a fact. You had to have two or three witnesses in perfect agreement. 
Well, Jesus and the Holy Ghost are witnesses of what God wants to do in your life. But to continue in the Father, that means that the Father is the one doing the work. It is, after all, is Jesus' church. Why was the church established to fulfill the will of the Father? Why did Christ come? Because the Father willed it. If you've got a burden to go out and to witness to somebody, whose will is that? It's the Father's. We are the instruments of the Father. Without Christ having died the sacrificial death that He did so that you could have the blood applied to your life, God couldn't use you. You were defiled. You were wicked. You were unholiness. And we know that God only deals with what? Holiness. With righteousness. So God had to make a way for you to once be redeemed. But after you're redeemed, God uses those things which are His. You guys don't go out and buy anything without the intention of using it. When God purchased you, He designed and He developed the perfect will of God for your life on how you could be used to get the most honor and glory for God. In order to accomplish that, you've got to continue in the Word. Because the Word will take you and is... Oh, hang on. Is it 2 Timothy 2.15, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed? the word will turn you into a workman not a worker a workman what's that that's somebody that knows the trade that's somebody that's become proficient that's somebody that instead of just having a hammer and a chisel that man's a carpenter doesn't matter what wood you put in front of him doesn't matter what kind of you know design you want put in it or what you want made out of it a workman can make it happen well, how do you become a workman that needeth not be ashamed? You've got to let God equip you. You've got to let God train you. You've got to let God develop you. But once you are, let's so to speak, for lack of a better term, a master craftsman, if that title's given to somebody, if they're a master engineer, a master carpenter, or a master mason, that means that they've attained the highest certification that they can in their field. In order for you to get that label on your life, that you're a master Christian, in truth, people will look at you and say, well, they're doing a lot. But if you were to ask the person, they'd say, I'm doing very little. God gave me all these tools and I did my best to learn how to use them, but I only use them where he tells me to. I only use them how he tells me to. And the only reason I know where to go is because he tells me to go there. The world would have you think that a master craftsman, they get to make all the decisions. They've got their own workshop. They've got their own apprentices. They've got their own understudies. They get to tell other people what to do. But see, to become a master Christian is to become somebody that's really good at following instructions. To continue in the Father is to daily reject your ability to control your life and petition God to once again do today what He did yesterday, which was lead God and direct your life. Did not Jesus say that no man cometh unto the Father except I draw him? Jesus was the one that drew you to the Father. And the Father's the one that wants to use you to bring glory and honor to His Son. And as a result, that more sons of God would be made. I know that Jeremiah, we've heard the message preached, he's down there in jail and he threw in the towel. You know why he couldn't leave the towel on the ground? Because he's, he was holy God's. He had a moment 
where in the flesh he said it's not worth it anymore nobody's listening nobody cares about the labor and the work that God's been doing but you know why he picked it back up because he was wholly sold out to God not saying you're not going to have days where you don't feel like quitting not saying that you're going to have days where you don't throw in the towel not saying you're not going to have days where you can't make sense of any of it like Job said he looked to the left the right in front of him he could not perceive where God was well because of the Holy Ghost you can't ever say that one but two if you say I just can't figure out what God's doing good that's not a comfortable place to be but if you're in that place it's because God knew he could trust you to put you into that place to continue in the Father it means that God's going to equip you with everything that you need so that everything in your life you can become victorious over it victory is a hard fought thing but the father doesn't desire any of his children to be destroyed. No, he wants them to conquer. Amen. To continue in the father is to embrace hardship. It's to embrace suffering. In fact, the apostles wrote that there was no greater call than to be a partaker of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Amen. To continue in the father is to know that rough roads are ahead but to put your will and your ego aside and to beg God to add more of the word to you so that when you get to that dark spot you've got a light under your feet a lamp under your path you know exactly which way you ought to go even in utter darkness to continue in the Father is to become the fruition of what God wanted you to be Now, I'm not saying that being saved isn't the greatest thing in the world, because it is. But too many people get satisfied with that and forget that God wants to turn you into something far greater than just a saved person. He wants to turn you into a, an ambassador, into a Christian, into a child of the King. He wants you to be able to get to glory and Him to heap crowns upon you for all of the things that you were faithful to do. And then in humility, we'll be more than happy to throw those crowns at the feet of Christ and to say, we were only able to do it because of Him. He gets the honor and glory for it. The Father wants to be able to look at you and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. When He opens up those books at the judgment seat of the Lamb, to show you the deeds done in your body after you got saved. He wants to be able to point out and only show good. That's his desire. He wants you to be the most honorable vessel that he has. Doesn't matter that he's got billions of them. He wants all of them to be just as honorable as the next. The only thing that prevents it from happening is you and I. let it happen but what is it that we're supposed to allow to happen let the word of God abide in you it's nothing new you don't have to re-understand you don't have to go out and get a new college degree all you've got to do is let that which you've heard from the beginning the same message abide in you because without it you cannot continue in the son and you cannot continue in the father but if you do continue every step along the way will be worth it there won't be a day that you'll look back and say you know what on that day I wish I wouldn't have followed God on that day I wish I wouldn't have been used for the master's use I wish I would have gone out and done something different So why are churches in the shape they're in today? Because they haven't let that which they've heard from the beginning abide in them. They haven't allowed God to continue the work that He started at Calvary in their life. And as a result of it, instead of a bunch of Christians, we've just got a bunch of saved people sitting on pews. 
We've got people that are content with where God got them in their spiritual life. And as a result, they want to go no further. Well, you can't let this abide in you and sit complacent. Because everything about this book tells me that I ought to go, that I ought to reach, that I ought to minister, that I ought to witness. You may not go far, but you can't stay where you are. You've always got to be busy about the Father's business if the Word abides in you. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.